Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and start. Um, my name is John Agnes. Uh, the talk is about proposing uh, a new tracer. That doesn't necessarily mean that it's something that's gonna land in F trace. Uh, maybe it's part of the, it becomes part of RTLA or uh, something else or just remains a set of scripts on my desktop. But the idea here is it's uh, t really taking a lot from the first three talks. I was really impressed because there's a lot of overlap and I'm gonna continue with that overlap, uh, but I'm going with another angle uh, than what we've had before. So hopefully this will uh, just get us thinking about uh, another approach that we need to have uh, or should have perhaps. So the reason why I wanted to do this talk is just to make it clear that preempt RT is gaining adoption. Yeah, there's more and more people using it. Uh, so I've been working for Linotronics for 10 years and we do support for various companies. And in, in my opinion, the companies are actually getting much better with Linux. However, they're not good with preempt RT. So they're trying to do real-time so systems. Independent that's independent of preempt RT. Preempt RT is not the problem. The problem is, is they don't know how to use it correctly, right? So they're taking this preempt RT that they've heard a lot about. They, that you know, if you need sub millisecond latencies, you have to take preempt RT. It's not an option. Uh, they're taking it and they're just implementing it incorrectly. Uh, they're, they're, their user space applications are implementing it incorrectly. And unfortunately, most of the time it works great. So they're choosing, they're choosing things wrong, they're implementing them wrong, but when they do their QA tests and everything, it works great, they're making products. Uh, there's companies that spend three years developing products based on this and they're actually doing it wrong. And then they ship them and then in the field, all of a sudden they're getting latency issues and they don't understand what's going wrong. The problem is, is they implemented it wrong. And so what they'll do is they'll maybe come to, to Linotronics and they'll say, hey, can you debug this problem, what's, what's going on there? And I do the same things that we saw with Steven and the stuff we saw with Daniel, going through and you know, doing the traces and analyzing. And at the end, I come to the conclusion they implemented their application wrong. And I come to this conclusion very, very, very often. It's not that we need to do a preempt RT patch, it's that they have to fix their application. Uh, and the problems are almost always the same. They're, all the companies are doing, making the same mistakes over and over again because they don't know how to use preempt RT correctly. So what, one of the things I'm pushing here is to, to provide a tracer so that companies can a little bit do it yourself on things that you're doing wrong, that it can just automatically tell them things that they're doing wrong without having to uh, involve uh, commercial support or something for, for preempt RT. Uh, but what that means is, is that when they do come to me, now there's a real problem, right? Like they're still maybe have problems, but now it's not gonna be, you know, they're doing something stupid in their application. Now they're gonna have real problems, which I also want. I don't wanna spend my time debugging some stupid thing and it's just because of page faults or something like this, right? I wanna have real uh, issues on my table. So by putting some, something into the hands of, of the people, of the developers, uh, we can give them a chance to, to take care of the simple stuff so that the real hard problems come to us. And I'm also not just talking about user space problems, I'm talking about real hard kernel problems that we still have a few of them that we have to tackle. So what are these common problems that I'm usually seeing? First of all, they're using the wrong APIs. Yeah, so they're using things like timer FD. Timer FD, was okay? Timer FD, you can't use that with preempt RT. It's never called from a hardware interrupt context. So you're guaranteed to have unreliable latencies. But people don't know this. A lot of real-time developers don't, don't even know this, right? So they're doing things with, the, uh, just last week I was with a company, they spent three years developing an entire product, huge 50 threads, real-time, and it's all based on timer FD. Uh, that's just not gonna work. And of course, everyone here knows that mutex, the defaults for the mutexes are not sufficient. Yeah, We need the priority inheritance uh, features need to be turned on. I also mentioned poll there because some co companies are doing a poll on like five different file descriptors from a real-time context and the different file descriptors are, have different importance. But if you're polling all five and now, you know, when the events come on the poll, you're gonna have automatic priority inversion, right? You can't, you can't be listening to multiple priorities at the same time, right? It's not gonna work. Memory management is something that they're also getting wrong. Everyone knows the magical mlock alt, been mentioned here in all three talks before me, uh, but that's not enough. mlock alt does not 
pre-fault the stacks, right? So if you call mlock all and you, your stack grows, you'll suddenly get a page fault in your stack. You have to pre-fault your stacks. And it's just not known, right? Uh, IPC, networking, IO, anyone here who's done, which almost every application needs these days, is extremely complicated. Because the problem with, if we're talking about IPC, if we're talking about pipes or message queues or anything like this, they're not directly connected by a mutex. So for example, if I'm writing into a message queue and that message queue is full, then I'm just going to go to sleep. There's nobody I can boost on the other side, no reader, I'm just going to go to sleep, right? So there's these things that are just complicated that you have to, you have to know about this. Uh, otherwise you think just magically, yeah, it'll priority boost when the message queue's full or something like this. No, this doesn't happen. And then of course, latencies are also something that's uh, not quite understood. And I'm going to take a second to pick on cyclic tests just as, a, as, a, as an example, uh, but and there's nothing against cyclic tests, but we've actually seen this now. Uh, I think all three presentations mentioned a form of this, the capital minus capital S is the same as minus T minus A. And this is the typical thing you see. You know, you're told, you run this, and you can see what your, what your uh, max latencies for your system are, right? But actually, this command is not very good for finding that out when you're developing a product. Uh, the first is, what about the tick, right? There's a lot of stuff that goes on in the tick. The tick could cost you up to 10, 15 microseconds if you're, if you're unlucky, right? So if you just call cyclic test this way, you may never hit the tick. And then you see a histogram with one, one mountain, and it looks great. But if you ever hit that tick, you're going to have a second mountain that's about 15 microseconds uh, shifted to the side. Depends on, on your luck. But there are ways that there are options for cyclic tests so that you can make sure you hit that tick. Your, hi, your histogram should always show two mountains, right? We want to see those two mountains when I miss the tick and when I hit the tick because it's going to make a big difference in your maximum latency. Or 99. Why, why is this example always with 99? I saw yours, it was 80, yours was good. Um, I did notice that. Uh, but a lot of the stuff in the internet you see is with 99. Uh, first of all, there's no reason for a user space application ever to use 99, because there's the migration kernel threads at 99, and they're running FIFO. Since when? Oh, really? Okay, oh, this is new. That's good. They even skip deadline. Wow, okay. That's good. And then I guess 99 is not as dangerous as anymore. It used to be that 99 was a big deal because you can't trump the migration thread anyway, so what's the point of even running cyclic tests there? You might as well run cyclic tests underneath it so that it always trumps, right? But I guess it always trumps now anyway. We, we change that because of that. Yeah. Okay. So <laughs> generally, I would still, in case it's an older kernel, I would still uh, never use more than 98, right? That should be the highest that user space ever touches, really. And then there's the fact about other real-time tasks, right? So if we're running it at this high priority, we're seeing this max latency, how much does this really tell me about my product, right? Like, because my product, like if I think of the company last week, they have like 50 threads with all real-time, different real-time priorities going on there. and they did this test once and they're like, yeah, okay, we can plan everything for maximum 80 microsecond latency. But that's not going to be true because their different threads are also causing latencies to the other threads, right? So it's not just about checking the highest thing. I need to know, I want to know what's the maximum uh, latency at, at 52, what's the maximum latency at 24 while my application is running so that I can understand the picture that I have. This thread is actually going to experience two millisecond latencies because of my other real-time stuff I have on top of it, right? So it's important that they can build a full picture. It's not just about one max number uh, for a product. And then this was also in, in a couple slides specifically mentioned uh, setting the, using the C, CPU DMA latency trick basically to avoid uh, the lower C states, right? To make sure that the CPU is running full. And this is actually the default of, of cyclic tests. I've, uh, I always, uh, I've, a couple times I've caused trouble on the mailing list about this because you have a measuring tool that's modifying the behavior of the system to get better performance numbers. And of course you could argue and say, yeah, but we want to see what the hardware technically could do. 
But most people don't understand that. Yeah, they don't understand that this measuring tool is actually modifying the behavior of the system. And if your system is not configured to isolate to the CPU, C state zero, then you're going to have totally different latencies in the field. And there's, there are arguments for, for cyclic tests uh, to avoid this hack, right? So this is how I always like to do the, the command. With the second line, you're making sure that you're hitting that tick so that we get the two mountains on our histogram. We should always see those two mountains. The minus minus default system, it used to be called minus minus laptop, uh, but then they said, okay, that's a stupid name. It's, it's, now it's called the default system, and all default system says is don't change the system behavior. Just measure, right? And that's what we want to do. We just want to measure the system. We don't want to modify its behavior. And these are really both very important features, right? And people just don't know about it. RTLA doesn't have the problem. Very good. So that was just kind of one example of how there's something that's so simple like cyclic tests. There's actually a, you know, a lot of little details that people don't know. And they're actually, you know, I see histograms and I, I can immediately see from the histogram that's not worst case, right? If I don't see that second mountain, it's not, not worst case. So we kind of talked about this earlier, actually. All day we've been talking about great topics here. Uh, creating real-time applications on Linux is actually quite hard. Now, of course, our marketing says, yeah, you have the POSIX and that, and it's much easier because you can take, take normal C programmers and they can immediately start doing stuff. This is all true. But if you actually want real-time performance in your real-time applications, it's actually quite difficult. And the reason why it's so difficult is because you have to understand what the kernel's doing. You have to understand the complexity of the kernel and how it's managing everything so that you can do it correctly. And a lot of vendors or product companies have problems with this because you know, they, they come from, a, maybe they previously did something with a real-time OS where all the APIs are allowed to be used or maybe the real-time APIs have an RT at the beginning of them or something like, th something like this. And then they come to Linux, there's, it's not clear at all. Am I allowed to use a message queue? Am I allowed to do this? Am I allowed to do that? Like, what am I allowed to do? You just have to know. You have to learn it because it's not labeled anywhere. It's a general purpose operating system. And so this is really the big hurdle that a lot of people have when they're moving to preempt RT. So this is just a couple of the main points, which, you know, we all, they've been talked about all day today. So Alana mentioned actually all of this stuff, uh, you know, avoiding page faults. Proper locking, which means we're using mutexes with inheritance that we have to activate. Proper notifying, so if we're doing like notification and locking, then we need to use the convars uh, combination. Uh, IPC communication, you have to understand how does this affect my priority inversion? What am I allowed to use? And really, I always recommend shared memory, right? Shared memory, you can actually do correct avo avoidance of, of priority inversion because you are controlling that notification mechanism. Yeah, you are controlling the data flow and you're allowing priority inheritance to happen. If you're using something like Unix local domain sockets, message queues, these kinds of things, then you have to really ask yourself, is that really a real-time channel that I'm, that I'm using there? Hardware communication. So when we're actually talking to controllers, talking on I squared C, talking uh, anything, we're doing GPIOs with the IO control, uh, is this something that's actually capable for real time? There's some systems that are hard. Anyone here who has done networking knows this pain. Yeah, there's a lot of things you have to be aware of and a lot of special situations you just have to handle and have to know. And the reason why is because most hardware drivers and subsystems these days are using K-workers uh, and software queues are still around, right? And they're a real headache for the preempt RT people, right? But this is how the kernel works. And then, of course, there was the great talk about RT, RT throttling. Um, I'm in the camp, definitely always minus one. If you need a software watchdog, you can implement your own that's above uh, your, your, your highest priority real-time application and have that one adjust real-time priorities or, or steal real-time priorities if someone's going crazy. Uh, but the, the RT, RT throttling is you immediately have a broken system. Yeah, it's like what Daniel said, it's, your system is broken when this happens. It's like an airbag in your car when it fires, you're not going to be driving afterwards. Your car is done, you get out, and that's the end of the trip, right? So uh, it's, it's not something just to kind of, you could maybe call it safety, but 
you know, if, if the safety mechanism is, is explodes, then I wouldn't call it safety, actually. It's good for the non-RT people, you know, because they don't trust us or whatever, and they have their non-RT kernels and all this stuff. But for RT, if you're serious about RT, then RT, RT throttling is a dangerous priority in inheritance uh, bomb, actually. A uh, priority inversion bomb, sorry. And the last thing, which makes it even more difficult, is they have to watch out for libraries. Yeah, someone who's developing applications for Linux, it's great, I can use all these libraries. That's one of the great features that we can use Linux because we have libraries. But are these libraries taking all these things into account? Even glibc, are they, is it really doing these things? If I, if I do an sprintf, is there a danger that some sort of malloc will happen or some sort of page fault will happen? Like, do I really know? Can I trust these base libraries even? And uh, it's, it's complicated. And you have to look at it. Every person has to look at it and decide for themselves. So how can we make this situation easier for these developers? Of course, documentation. But that's not the scope of this talk. So obviously, if we had you know, someone out there writing books about this or something, that's missing. That is a huge hole right now. Uh, the information in Google that you're getting is very mixed, and it's misleading. Right? So we need some definitive documentation at some point, definitely. It's not Google's fault. They're just finding it. But chat GPT will be spitting it out soon, right? Or Bart. Or Bart. Okay, so what am I doing with my talk is I'm actually talking about providing a built-in tricer or maybe something that's part of RTLA that will monitor a real-time application and just look for it doing stupid things, right? So it's, it's different than what we heard from, from Stephen and what we heard from Daniel where it was more like, we have a certain problem and we want to analyze it. That's not what, what I'm going for. I'm going from an angle that we have an application and we just want to see if it's doing stupid things, even if it's hitting all of its deadlines. We just want to see if it's doing stupid things, like using timer FD, right? So just if we can just monitor that, then it will help a lot of application developers to just say, okay, I guess I'm not supposed to use that. And then maybe they'll look at why. Right? So we'll actually take a look at a live demo in a minute of something that I, that I scripted up uh, to show these four points, right? So to report, so live report page faults, uh, live reporting if, an, if a real-time application goes into the S state, unless it's doing it by clock nano sleep, that's good, or it's doing it because it's blocking on a priority inheritance mutex, that's good. Those are two reasons to go to the S state. Question? Yeah, so this is, uh, I, it's not, this is only for RT applications. So this is only. Sure, but then they're not. Sure, but the, the, those tasks are not running with an RT priority then. Right, so I'm, ta I'm just talking about, so the question or the comment was, there are multi-thread applications where some of the threads are not doing real-time activity. Right, so what I'm talking about is, I guess it's, I guess I should say, instead of RT applications, I say RT tasks. Right, so I'm talking about monitoring RT tasks. Right, which generally is RT applications, but it doesn't have to be. Okay, so I'm, I don't care about, unless it's a kind of RT policy, I do not care uh, what it's doing. But if it does have one, I'm checking if it's doing page faulting, I'm checking if it's going into the S state for some other reason, whatever the reason is. Um, I'm reporting how much time I was preempted by a higher priority task, right? So if there's a bunch of, you know, a bunch of threads in my system that are higher priority and they do a bunch of stuff, that I just get the information, hey, I was preempted for two milliseconds. Not because of a bug in the kernel, but because my own software is preempting itself. Uh, and that I just am aware of these things that are happening. And then, of course, if any, at any time an RT task is blocking on a mutex without prio inherit, we should know about this, right? Maybe we're using some library, something from QT or who knows what. Uh, you'd be amazed what everyone's using these days. Uh, and it just has a normal mutex, right? And uh, we need to know, hey, we're blocking on mutexes that aren't priority inheritance uh, capable. And there's a lot more things that I am interested in. I'll talk about this later at the, at the end. Some more things that I also think are interesting. 
But I have implemented all of these things uh, in, in a, an example that we can, we can take a look at right now. There's only four examples we'll go through. I did this with a BPF, uh, BPF trace script. I don't know if everyone's familiar with BPF trace. Uh, BPF trace is using BPF, but it has its own high level scripting language. So it's very easy to actually write scripts with BPF and it'll compile them using BCC and putting them into the, the kernel to run. Now the reason why I chose BPF trace is because for what I did, and we'll take a look at it later, is I needed BPF. I needed to get at things that are not available in F trace. For example, if I'm doing a, some, some function is being called and I wanna know is it a real time task? I need to get at the, the, pri the prior field of the, cur of the task struct that's not available anywhere, right? With BPF, I can get this information really easy, right? So I can actually see, is this something that's related to real time or not? And then I can just ignore it, or I can decide to start tracking it. Yeah, I mean, that's another option, right? And that's, we could say, this is why, actually my suggestion was to say, if, if it was a built-in tracer, like IRQ latency and stuff like this, then we can add all of the hooks we want. Or we could say we want to do RTLA and then we're going to use BPF for that and grab all the information we need. And, and there's... So the, the, the possibilities are endless. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look at this live demo here. And this, the purpose of this live demo, it's... Uh, I hacked it actually this morning, not last night. Uh, but the, the purpose of it is not that it looks nice, it's just that you kind of get a feel of the things that it detects uh, and automatically reports, which is, uh, can be really interesting. So this is actually running in a, in a KVM because I wanted a more modern kernel. Uh, these two windows, but they're running on the same, same machine. And I'm gonna start, uh, in this window, I'm gonna start the, uh, I think everyone can see that. Uh, I'm gonna actually start the, the BPF trace program uh, that's going to load everything in. And all I'm doing is I'm just using print. So one of the features of BPF trace is you can do printing. And then it actually does the, it does the formatting in a different context, but and it just streams it out, and so you can actually see uh, so printing information, right? So it's not s super efficient, but for proof of concept that you can kind of see what's going on there, it's, it's actually fine. Uh, and maybe we'll take, a look at, take a look at this really quick, just to see what this thing looks like. So I mean, it's not huge, right? This is, this is 100, 100 lines here, but if you look, it's, it's mostly, there's a couple big ones there, but mostly it's pretty small, that's the whole thing. Right, all four of those things are being uh, covered with this. Uh, and the way that it works here is that, for example, there are certain situations where I want to say it's allowed to go into the S state because, for example, the IRQ threads, they're gonna go into the S state every time they handle an IRQ, that's okay. Or the, the SMP boot threads that are started there, for example, there's the, what was the one that kept bothering me? Ah, I forget. There's, but there's, I guess, a handful of threads there that are all running real-time real priority one, like the RCU threads and stuff. Uh, they're going to keep going into the S state, and I didn't want to debug those. That's all kernel stuff. This isn't about debugging the kernel. This is about checking user space applications. And so the way it works is, uh, for example, I have a K probe for IRQ thread. This is the function when we're going to in, invoke the handler we're in a while loop and we're gonna actually just invoke the handler. And at one point there's actually a schedule there and that's what's actually gonna make it go to sleep. So here you see I'm, I'm inserting a K probe uh, offset 191 from IRQ thread. This is right before we call schedule. I have a K probe in there and this BPF program is being inserted at that point, right? So basically I have to have a hash table here called allow S states based on the task ID. I'm just gonna set a value of one, which means uh, this is, we're right before schedule, so if we go to sleep at this point, we're okay. We're in the RAQ thread function, uh, and it's totally normal that we sleep there, right? So I just set a one there, and then offset 196 is when we come out of the schedule. I just use object, uh, object dump to, to get these offsets. Uh, and then I can uh, just delete it, because now we've finished with the schedule, so now I don't want this in my hash table anymore. I remove the entry from the hash table, right? And this is just, to kind of show you the elegance of BPF trace, how easy that is to insert the hash tables. I can start tracking things at an arbitrary place inside the kernel uh, without there being any, any special uh, trace points or function tracers or anything like this. I mean, it's the magic of, of K-probe, right? K-probe and BPF. 
Uh, I do the same thing for the SM, SMP boot threads here. Yeah, so offset 219, I'm gonna say, okay, insert it into my uh, hash table that this task is, it's okay if it goes into the S state, and at offset 224, when we come out of that schedule, then I'm gonna remove it from the hash. It's just so that we're not getting noise from these things because this is something that I think is okay uh, for it to go into the S state. Uh, if we look at something a little bit more interesting, for example, the do nano sleep, uh, here I'll be, I'm K probe on do nano sleep, uh, and here also, if we're going into do, uh, do nano sleep, it's okay that we go into the S state. I'm expecting that. And what you should also notice here, I guess I should have mentioned here, this second line in, in BPF trace, this is an expression you can set to whether or not the BPF program is executed or not. Right? So I'm actually using the, the current task struck, the preo field, to decide if it's less than 99, which means it's a real-time priority. Uh, that's the only time I'm even gonna go into these BPF programs. So if the, if the task is not a real-time task, nothing is gonna change, right? So the only time I'm even going into these programs on every single one of my uh, BPF trace uh, scripting functions, I don't know what you call them, <laughs> B, BPF snippets, I use this exact same uh, condition that we're only gonna execute it when we're in a real-time task. So that's why we're going into do, do, nano, do, uh, do nano sleep, we're a real-time task, we're gonna uh, note that that task is allowed to go into the S state, and then when we return from that do nano sleep, we're gonna remove it then from that hash table again. Uh, same thing with the futex lock priority inheritance. If I'm a real-time task and I go to lock a mutex and it has priority inheritance, uh, then I'm allowed to go into the S state. It's totally normal, that's okay, right? So basically I'm just marking areas where I'm allowed to go into the S state there. So the last section which gets a little bit trickier is the SCED switch. Uh, the SCED switch here is actually checking two different things. Uh, it's checking to make sure, uh, or it's keeping track of when I get preempted then it's taking a, uh, the timestamp of that and whenever I get rescheduled, then it's gonna capture that difference uh, and print out the output here. So the first part here is really just keeping track of this when I was preempted by someone with more priority. Uh, and here you see that I'm using another hash table called sket out R state. Uh, this is just to track was I scheduled out. So if I was, uh, if I was scheduled out, then here I'm just going to, I mean, it's kind of, I didn't do it very nice here, but I basically I just calculate the difference here and I give the output preempted run and I give all the information uh, that it was preempted for a certain amount of nanoseconds. And here you see that if my previous state is zero, which means I'm runnable, think about it, we're in the sched switch and my previous state is runnable and I'm an RT task, that's where I want to start tracking, right? So that's where the entry into the hash table goes when I'm being scheduled out and I was runnable and I was RT. Then I want to track that and then when I get scheduled back in, that's when I can then remove the hash and print. So that's for tracking how, how long I was scheduled out. Uh, the second part is about when I'm sleeping, when I'm going to sleep for something, right? So first of all, I just check, um, is the previous state one, right? Because if the previous state is one, that's where we going to sleep. So if it's not one, if it's something else, then it's not interesting at all, right? So we come down here, we know, okay, I was, I'm, I, I'm, I went to sleep, right? And this is where it's interesting. I just check, are you allowed to go to sleep? Because if you're allowed to go to sleep, then I'm just gonna go ahead and delete it and say, yeah, that's okay, you're allowed to go to sleep. But if you are not in that allowed to go to sleep hash table, then I'm going to say, someone went to sleep and I'm gonna give all the information, this task went to sleep and it wasn't because of nano sleep and it wasn't because of blocking on a mutex, right? And then the last ones uh, here, really simple, just showing page faults, right? So here are just the page fault kernel and the page fault user, which do not actually capture all the page faults, these are just the exceptions. So in my opinion, uh, things like mlock all or page faults due to the stack page faulting, they are not counted as exceptions because the kernel is doing it on purpose and so it doesn't actually cause an exception. In my opinion, we should be tracking those as well. Right? But I, I'm just using what's there right now. Um, although I could have also put a K probe uh, in the mlock all uh, code or in the stack 
uh, where it does page fault in the stack. I could have added some k-probes there. Okay, and then the last one here is just uh, just do few ticks. Uh, this is just to kind of show an example of a real specific example, and this is just to show that I'm a real-time task, and I'm doing a few ticks call with the op zero, which means I'm doing a lock. And in this case, it's not it's not a priority inheritance because the op zero you only do if it's not with priority inheritance. Otherwise you do, I think it's number six or something like this, or number five, something like this. So the fact that I'm doing it op zero means that this priority inheritance is not set. I am a real time task though, so I'm also gonna give that information out. And then the rest is just clean up at the end and uh, initialization stuff. So it's really not a whole lot there. I should be careful. Yeah, that, I, try, I did a couple tests to try to trigger something. I couldn't. Yeah, I, Convar wasn't. But. Yeah, I know we had that problem before. I'm not sure if that's if that problem still exists, but. I mean, yeah, but Convars was completely rewritten, and I thought they changed the semantics now there. But I, because I wanted to trigger that exact situation, and I couldn't, couldn't trigger it. But maybe I didn't. It needed a more complicated example of uh, blocking. Okay, so that's the whole thing, uh, and you see at the top for my for the um, interpreter. Yeah, I saw about them. I Maybe that's being used for the convoy. Anyway, I just wanted my demo to work. I didn't. Uh, but you see here. But, Yeah, I'd have to, you need to take some time for it, but yeah. But I mean, you see how easy it is to get these things yeah. with BPF. Yeah, it's so easy to just grab. You want the third argument, you want some, you, just, you need some out from the current task truck, anything, you just can grab them. So it's really nice. Okay, so let's actually do the demos. So, uh, oh, now at the top, I specify BPF trace as the interpreter, right? So I have to just run this like a script. It's gonna run BPF trace, and as the first argument, it's my script, right? So that's just running. It's set up to run for, I think, 10 minutes, which should, oh, it has to be real time. So that's running now. Actually, the first time takes a little, uh, takes a little while because of my virtual machine and this, this machine. But it sets, I think, 15 K probes and then ready. Okay. So uh, you already see something already came up. So for example, uh, this K timers task was actually preempted by something. I, I didn't say what it was be preempted by because it could be all kinds of stuff, but it was de it was definitely preempted by something higher priority, and that was so 390 microseconds. This is running in a KVM, even though it's an RT kernel, so you know you can't trust the, the numbers right now. But okay. So the first thing I want to show is just running a bash. So for example, if I um, let's go ahead and move down here so everything's at the bottom. So let me go ahead and uh, start a real-time bash shell here. And you immediately see lots of things, uh, page faults that have happened, you know, things we'd expect, nothing exciting here. Uh, I'm doing the kernel stack trace for, uh, for, for some of the events. So for example, uh, if, it, if it's going into the sleeping state, I actually show, so you can see that, for example, and select is being done. And every time, like if I press the L key, you know, because it's reading, right? So then it goes back to sleep, and I do the S key, and it does some more, and I hit return, and that ran LS, right? So the bunch of page faults and all this stuff. But it's just things that you're just seeing that are happening that are live on the system. And if I'm doing my real-time application correctly, I shouldn't see anything. I shouldn't see anything. It's just showing me things that I'm probably doing wrong at a real-time priority. Right? I shouldn't be real-time priority if I'm doing these kinds of things. 
Okay. So let's go ahead and oops, go to the next uh, demo. So this is a this is an IPC program. It uses uh, shared memory just to communicate data. So basically, data will be write, written in shared memory. It's it's doing things correctly with priority inheritance and mutexes and convars and all these things, uh, just to kind of see what goes there. Actually, uh, when we do trainings and stuff, I actually use this example to show people how to do things correctly. However. When I start this example, oops, there's a reader and a writer because it's using shared memory with um, two processes. You see that I'm actually externally giving them the real-time priorities, right? So that means there's going to be page faults that show up because I'm immediately giving them real-time priority and then they do all the page faulting there. Uh, so I start, start the receiver in the background. I have to type some message in the sender. Uh, no, the receiver's in the background. Then I start the sender. I type some message and then it will get sent to the receiver, right? So I'll just go ahead and... Uh, run that. So it'll ask me for some message. Uh, hello world. And I guess that. Now you'll see that nothing happened after that message came, right? Maybe I should do it a little bit slower here. Right. So when I start this, at the beginning we get all these page faults, and we have a, a sleeping that's happening because I'm reading. I'm doing an f get s. Yeah. The sender wants to know what should I send, right? So that's and I'm doing all this stuff in a real time context, right? But in the moment where I actually type my message. Right, so I'll go ahead and add some space there. We say nothing else because I did the, the rest of the application is fine. It was just the setup was wrong, but this made me realize I'm doing the setups wrong. Actually, you shouldn't be in a real time context when you're setting yourself up, right? Because there might be other real time t applications on the system, and I'm affecting them, right? So this whole idea of you have to really be aware: do I need to be in a real time context or need or not? And to pre-fault uh, my stack and to do all this stuff, I don't need to be real-time context, and I should not be real-time context, right? And so this kind of helps to point that out, which even for me was a little bit of a, a you know, aha moment uh, that I saw that there. Um, the next example is just with a mutex. So this is a really uh, horrible uh, coded example, but this is just to show that we have a thread uh, that's going to take a mutex, and I'm not setting the inherit, yeah, so it's commented out. Uh, and then I'm going to start a secondary thread. So basically, it's just going to take it and hold it for 10 seconds. And the secondary thread is going to try to grab it. And we're in a real-time context here yeah, with the scheduled priority of I one. This is just to show that we're seeing those messages, right? So if I uh, run the mutex program, uh, let me hold on. So, and you see here that we're seeing the non-PI futex wait, and we're seeing the sleeping situation, right? Because both things are happening here. Um, I'm sleeping on that mutex, so I went into sleeping, and that wasn't one of the two criteriums. And like a fine detail is I'm doing a non-priority inheritance uh, blocking on a mutex, right? So we're seeing both of those uh, examples there. Oops, I didn't need to end that. And then two more demos. Then there's a busy demo. This is just a, also a really quick uh, program. Uh, basically, I start a thread that's just busy, uh, busy waiting uh, with a priority I, with a priority one. And I have another thread that's just going to, it's going to sleep at the beginning. And then it's just going to jump in there for some loops and then jump out. So it's just to show that we're interrupting another thread, just to show that that's accounted for, right? So let me just go ahead and. Uh, run the busy program. So this is just to show you that what that looks like. So I don't do a backtrace or anything like this. But this is showing you that this task, the the PID 572, was actually interrupted uh, twice. It was, it was scheduled vec, uh, scheduled away. And you know, for the first time, that was actually when my program did it. This is when my program ended. Ended. Uh, I don't know who that was. That might have been some. Um, some interrupt handler or something that ran there really quick. But you can see, I can actually see, I have real-time tasks that are getting scheduled out in the runnable state, right? You should know these things are happening, right? So I can see those things. And then the last demo is cyclic test itself, right? So if I use this cyclic test, then the question is, oh, what's, what's it gonna look like in cyclic test? Uh, cyclic test, SMP, mlock all, priority, I'll just do, I'll go ahead and do 98. Sec aligned, 
mind and default system. Hmm. So just to kind of see what it's doing there. Now this only has one CPU, but what you see here is that obviously if it's running at a priority 98, it's gonna be interrupting lots of other tasks the whole time, right? Which it's actually doing here, right? So you can see the, the RCU and all these things, they're all being interrupted. Cyclic test is only there for a moment, but it is interrupting these other real-time tasks there, right? So we can see all these real-time tasks that are being, you know, for 39 milliseconds, 36 milliseconds, uh, microseconds. So it's, but this is a KVM, yeah, so don't. Don't take the numbers too seriously. But the point is, is that you, you see all that stuff. But what you didn't see with cyclic tests is there were page faults, you didn't see it sleeping, you didn't see it calling mutexes that weren't priority inheritance. So cyclic test is doing those things correctly, which is really great. It just started off by just preempting everybody. Okay. So my vision really is when I thought, okay, when we have something like this, that people can kind of see there's things, how is this gonna affect how people develop their software? First of all, and this is how it would affect me, they would probably drop their real-time priority whenever they have to do something that's not real-time critical. This is actually quite similar to security applications. They'll drop their capabilities so that they can do some stuff and then they'll just grab the capabilities when they're actually doing something. And you can actually start to see this kind of thing. You know, if I do need to log to a file and I know I'm not in real-time context anymore, then I just drop my real-time context. I don't log to the file anyway, right? So I just, I'm actively making sure that I'm only using RT when I actually need RT. Maybe there's certain system calls or certain IO I do where I say, okay, the, our system's offline, so this task uh, is also coming out of real-time uh, priority and now it can do non-real-time stuff, for example. People are gonna have to simplify their IPC models because Unix domain sockets and message queues and this kind of pipes is a disaster for real-time. And a lot of people just don't know that. And when they see their application sleeping all the time, they're gonna keep getting sleeping, 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 sleeping. It's because they're using these IPC methods. They're gonna to have to use shared memory or something like this so that they can guarantee they don't go to sleep. And I think they will also tend to wanna to program multi-process instead of multi-threaded. Because when you're multi-threaded, there may be some things that you're doing in JLibc where you're actually having a, a conflict, you're actually um, contending with something in glibc with threads that are not real time. Like, you know, maybe you're doing something and there's some sort of, you do an S print or something like this and there's memory al uh, allocation and now for a moment you're actually contending with uh, another non real time task inside of the application, right? So these kinds of things would show up that, why am I sleeping? What's going on there? Uh, and it's because you're contending with, or maybe the non uh, priority inheritance mutex would show up, something like this, right? So. Uh, people will realize multi-process, with just dealing with one, you don't have to worry about these things. Uh, having a multi-thread application that's half real-time and half not real-time, in my opinion, is a little bit of a dangerous game, right? Because you're sharing common resources of the libraries you're using. And then, of course, this will also help that people only use RT when they really need it. And I'm not talking about dropping RT, I'm talking about this application doesn't need to be RT. Uh, I see a lot of, uh, users, developers, they say, okay, I need a preempt RT system. We have 50 threads. All 50 threads have to be RT priority, right? And that doesn't make sense. There's only maybe like three or four threads that actually are doing real-time work. They're, more, they're abusing real-time uh, in order to just kind of make things go faster or to run smoother or something like this. But this is, this is garbage. For the non-RT stuff, you've got C groups with CPU scheduling and you've got nice values. And that is an enormously flexible tool for the non-real-time stuff. Use that and really decide what needs to be real-time. And if they, they will decide, when they have something that's complaining at them, they'll make as little of it real-time as possible to get out of these complaints. Right? And then of course, the biggest benefit is they'll start using the correct APIs. They'll realize, oh, I can't do that mutex, I can't use timer FD, I can't do all this. They'll realize this and then they'll have to look at the documentation or in chat GPT or whatever, hopefully it knows it. Uh, and find the correct APIs. And then they run their application and it doesn't complain at all, right? It's just silent the whole time. And that doesn't mean their application is correct, but it's a lot more correct than it was, right? So when they do have a problem and they come back, then it's probably a really complex problem, right? So that's something uh, different there. 
Okay, and then these are just, for me, some final thoughts. Uh, when I was uh, writing up this ftrace script, you know, the other things that are interesting, what about the D state? You know, is that something that we need to be tracking? Uh, what about if I'm being woken up from a K worker or from the K software IQ daemon or I'm being woken up from a non-RT task? Is that, is that an alarm? Is that something I should be saying? Hey, because if a K worker is waking me up, I'm probably doing something uh, that I shouldn't be doing, right? Generally speaking. Uh, I'm also not checking the, the, the clocks on NanoSleep. So if it's a real-time clock versus the, the monotonic clock, that's maybe also something to check. Uh, it was mentioned earlier about the CPU scaling and stuff. That may be also something we want to mention is that, hey, uh, there's CPU scaling going on here, right? Just something that we can just complain about. Uh, there might be some more safe syscalls. Maybe in the GPIO subsystem, it's okay to do the IO controls. I haven't looked at it that closely. Right, so there might be a whole bunch of things that we can say it's okay to go into the S state, it's okay to go into S state here, uh, and, and, and mark those. And then also the idea of uh, really convars are designed for wake up lock. Wake up lock, if that's the pattern, I wake up and I have to grab a lock, that's what convars are actually for. Uh, so if someone's, you know, using a mutex with a semaphore and we can notice, hey, you're doing a, you're, so you're re reacting off the semaphore, which is okay, it's a, it's a notification method. But grabbing that mutex is not good because we have a we have a special type for that, right? So these are things we could auto detect. We could start just you know notice things just in, in hash tables and BPF and say, hey, okay, uh, you just did this and now you just did that. Uh, maybe you should be using convars, right? So things that we could actually maybe make suggestions there. And that's it. So are there uh, any questions, comments, feedback? Steven, someone with the mic. No, actually, it's very, I mean, it's very good. And uh, I mean, BPF trace is fine, everything else, but I'm thinking for a general purpose, uh, I would be, um, a lot of this information probably be, would be useful to have a tracer, create a new tracer, that's what tracers are for, to right. do something unique, and then you could add everything you want in the tracer, you'll probably have a little bit more flexibility because you're in the kernel doing that. And then what I would do on top of this would be having, um, integrating RTLA so that, because uh, I was thinking about other use cases, like like it was like when you're showing here, I don't care about cyclic tests interrupting all these other tracers. So having a user space tool that reads trace that maybe the trace is showing all this, but you could tell the RTA, I only want this trace, mm -hmm. or I only want these things traced. Yep. Ignore everything else. So I think having a combination of user space and inside the kernel tracer would be advantageous to, and probably do a lot more. And again, having it in the kernel, as per BPF traces, there's a lot of environments that BPF is not really available. But if you just say, hey, enable this, you know, event, run your thing, and then you might be able to do a lot more tracking. Yeah, yeah that was why originally, that's why the title says new tracer, because I think, and really we're talking about a general set of rules that people should be following. Yep. Uh, so, I mean, these rules we can all agree on. Yeah, we want to have a notice if that happens, right? So. Yeah, and like I said, um, I could see a lot of cases where you want to ignore things or you want to do different things or you want to set up a bunch of parameters, um, in, which would require a BPF trace, require editing the BPF trace file to do it. Or like I said, if we had a, a user space tool like RTLA that just said, hey, you know, I want, uh, that it tells you, and that, in fact, what, what's nice about RTLA would be is the fact that it could detect something, like you said, with the, the pattern with the semaphore for and the mutex, it could actually say, we noticed this pattern, perhaps you want to use this instead. So it yeah. actually could have more uh, input to the user. Yeah. That, that, that's the idea behind RTLA. That, that's the idea behind RTLA, serve as a helper, oops, <laughs> for, for the tracers. We can also use RV for this, but there was a question here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, maybe something thought to enhance. Uh, what about uh, ugly things happen in the kernel side? while I develop my drivers, such as uh, when I disabling interrupts or disabling preemption, or maybe use this spin locks, uh, you know, yeah, I all think spin locks. That's more what RTL is for then, right? So. But maybe this tool can uh, reveal also this situation when I use uh, it. The reason why, I, maybe, the reason why, the only reason I would say is maybe not is because I want to have something I can trust so that I can really like whitelist the kernel threads, whitelist, because that makes the rules a lot easier when we can, 
whitelist the complexity in the kernel and, and just focus on what the user space is doing, right? So if we're saying, yeah, I'm developing my driver and I don't want to trust uh, kernel threads anymore, then the rules might have to get a lot more complex. But that might be something where we can say, yeah, for this thread, I do want to make sure it doesn't go into the S state or these kinds of things. Yeah. Just for, so, so uh, one thing that, that came to my mind that I talked to you before, and that's something that was on my to-do list, is that we can easily write a state machine, state machine that represents all the states that you have here and the composition of them. And those are, are candidates for RV monitors, mm -hmm. where you can track those things. And, and RV monitors, they run in kernel, they are C kernel code, and we can add any type of configuration option for the monitor that we have. So we can say, I would like to start this monitor, this monitor only traces RT, for example, but we can say filter only this task. Mm -hmm. or, and then we can add any, yeah. any, any kind of filtering that we would like to do. And the, and the good thing about doing it inside the RV is that, okay, you have heard, is that uh, it, it's already the documentation. The state machine is the documentation. Yeah, yeah that's true. Yeah, I think the only tricky part is if we would want to go the BPF route or somehow try to in integrate it with the tracer or that, just because you, at the end of the day, you need to grab that data that's not available anywhere, right? So. Oh, oh, yeah, but yeah, RV, it, it's connected with tracing subsystem. Mm -hmm. So you can output trace output to the trace subsystem it's ah, part of okay. tracing subsystem. Oh, nice. So I had one comment and one question. Okay. So the comment would be that if we don't have uh, like note in my pages saying this is not RT safe, we shouldn't really blame users. We should really update the documentation, but that's beside the point. My question was, uh, you showed the script and it seemed to like uh, refer kernel symbols and offsets. Mm -hmm. So that's not very portable, right? So. Uh, what do we need to do this properly or main, in a maintainable way? Yeah, so like what Steven, Steven suggested is if it was actually an RT, tra it was a tracer, one of the current available tracers, right? And then we're just adding code into the kernel, right, at these points. The, the reason why I had to use these offsets is because I, this is an out-of-the-box Debian RT kernel. I didn't touch the kernel code, and so obviously I had to f use object dump to disassemble and find those points and insert the k-probes. So this will break with the next kernel update, right? So with the kernel update, it would break, yes. Yes, thank you. Yeah. It's also possible to add the trace hookers that you can hook to that point or add sure. a trace yeah. point. Yeah. It's just a proof of concept to sh so you see it, right? I mean, it might work, it depends. Symbol moves. <laughs> uh, symbol changes. As another uh, enhancement uh, that may be done, uh, when you are catching uh, incorrect uh, mutexes or incorrect uh, memory allocation or page faults in your case, uh, you may be better to point out uh, where in the program it happens. Uh, mm. For this, you need user space uh, stack. Yeah, actually, to, 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 to do user space stack, uh, uh, lots of systems just don't allow you from kernel space to. Uh, trace user space, uh, so maybe it's better to send a signal to application that mi misbehaves, and That's rely on uh, I don't know ki kill this application uh, and yeah. have uh, core dump. But actually, BPF trace does support user space stacks. Uh, I ha originally I had it turned on, but there's comes there's so many user space page faults that it was like distracting. I thought because you see all these stacks, but it does have user space stack is supported uh, in BPF Trace. It support user space uh, stack on all platforms? I don't know the, how wide it is, but I could uh, I could add it really quick. It would two, uh, two seconds. Because uh, signal handling uh, usually uh, can help you with uh, user space stack on uh, almost all platforms. I think both platforms have user space stack. Uh, sort of, if it has like frame buffers in there. Or frame, po not frame buffer, frame, frame pointers. pointers. Yeah. Uh, if they have frame pointers enabled, yes, then does. If you have frame pointers disabled a lot of times, like I know Perf does this hack where it just records like 2K or 4K of the user space stack and then just pre-processes looks for the uh, addresses. But we are working on S frames, which if that gets probably be like two or three years out where um, just look up S frames and you'll see where actually it puts in a uh, uh, inside the ELF format field a kind of an orc unwinder 
that the kernel could actually read and figure out the stack trace um, at that time. So. S frames. S frames, yes. But one thing that he mentioned is that maybe you would like to take an action when you go into an exception of your tracer. And that's why the RV, I, I see this connected to uh, RV. Okay, yeah. Because on RV we can take like a reactions to the, when you go out of the, the design. Yeah. There's a question from a virtual attendee. Um, I'm listening to the criticism of cyclic test not allowing uh, high C states by default. And I'm thinking, would you not recommend an RT application writer to use the same trick? Should your tool detect transition to a high C state? I mean, that's a good question. Uh, the question is really, is, is, my, is my product allowed to run that way, right? So obviously it's gonna run a lot harder, a lot more power consumption. You may actually have warranty issues with the chip uh, vendor by running my product at C state zero the whole time, right? So there, there's no universal answer yeah. because it depends on your requirements. So if you <clears throat> if your latency requirements are very small, then you probably don't want to have uh, deep C states. On the other hand, if it's a relaxed uh, real time system where you can tolerate the wake up time out of deeper C states, which is up to 100 microseconds for the deepest, for the more deep ones. And you, you still m uh, make your deadline, why wouldn't you save power? Mm -hmm. I mean, there's no real answer to that. Yeah. So, so you have to know, I mean, re real time is hard because you have to design the system based on the requirements and not throwing a real-time kernel at the thing and say, oh, it's real-time now. It doesn't work. That's like, uh, I mean, just because you have a firewall does, uh, installed on your computer doesn't make your computer secure. You have to actually engineer the firewall in order to make it correct. So just the fact that there's a firewall doesn't tell you anything. So this is really engineering and people have have to put engineering resources onto onto uh, on the system level onto it and i mean it gets more complex if you add safety but then it's nothing else than system level engineering it's a great question uh, it should be clear that i'm not advocating that you do or don't use the c states I was just pointing out that cyclic test modifies the behavior. If you want to have your product do that, that's fine, that's your decision. But the fact that the measuring tools are doing that for you is a problem because I see it on real customers where cyclic test has great results, but for some reason in our application, we see much worse results. Yeah, the, tool is doing, the measuring tool is doing a tuning that not necessarily your workload is doing. Hmm. So the workload needs to respect the tooling. That, that it, it's not a problem. Great, done, thank you.